Welcome to the second video on inverse Laplace. This one is focusing on partial fractions. So the previous video introduced the concepts of inverse Laplace and core principles. It also covered step one of an inverse Laplace, that is factorization of the pole polynomial. What we want to do next is look at the partial fraction steps. And we're going to do this using two different methods, an expansion method and the cover-up rule. So first of all, a reminder of the key steps in inverse Laplace. The first video focused on step one, which is to identify the denominator factors R subscript I of S. And it was noted that if these were quadratic, please leave the factors as quadratic when the roots are complex. Right, this slide focuses on step two, that is the partial fraction step. What we need to do is write out our transfer function, which originally was q over p, as a sum of smaller terms, c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2, all the way up to cn over rn, where these r's are the minimal form factors, first order for real roots, quadratic for complex roots. Having written it in this form, we want to identify the values for c i of s. That's the real challenge. Now the final step, which is straightforward and doesn't need much discussion, is to do inverse Laplace on each individual term. So let's look at step two. What we want to do is identify suitable c i so that we can write our original transfer function q over p as c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2 and so on. Now, we're going to look at two main techniques. First, an expansion technique. This is straightforward to understand. However, it can be a bit cumbersome and involve a lot of writing and algebra. And therefore, it's not something I would always recommend unless you feel safe doing it. The alternative is the cover-up rule. Now, this is a lot more efficient in terms of algebra, but it can only really be used for real roots. Now, what I would say is if you've got real roots, the cover-up rule is to be preferred. However, if you do have quadratic factors because of complex roots, you'll have no choice but use the expansion technique for those particular parts of the partial fraction expansion. So expansion technique, how does it work? Well, the first thing we've got to do is look at where we're heading. We've got f of s equals q over p equals c1 over r1 plus c2 over r2 and so on up to cn over rn. And we're going to note that the pole polynomial is the product of all these denominator factors, p equals r1 times r2 all the way up to rn. Right, what are we going to do next? We're going to multiply up both sides of the equation by the denominator p of s. So what's that going to do when we do that? We end up with this. You can see q equals c1 times r2, r3 all the way up to rn, plus c2 times r1, r3 all the way up to rn, and so on, up to cn times r1, r2 all the way up to rn minus 1. Now the key thing to note, and I'll write it here, is there's no r1 in this particular term, there's no r2 in this particular term, there's no rn in this particular term. OK, hopefully that's obvious, because when you multiply up, P has got all the R's, and therefore if you write multiply C1 over R1 by all the R's, the R1 terms cancel. Now, finally, we get to step three, which simply says equate the coefficients of the powers of S on each side of the equation. So you've got Q on one side and all these other terms on the other side. Now, this is just a concept slide. If we throw some examples, it will probably be much clearer. So here we go. First example, we've got g of s equals 4 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. First step is to say, what do the partial fractions look like? So there we go. You can see we can separate that into a over s plus 1 plus b over s plus 2. Step 2, we're going to multiply up by the denominator. Now in this case, the denominator if I write it, we've got R1 equals S plus 1, R2 equals S plus 2. So we're going to multiply up by S plus 1 times S plus 2. So there we go. And what do we get? We get 4 
equals a times s plus 2 plus b times s plus 1. Now having done that, the final step, step 3, is to equate the coefficients of the powers of s to give us simultaneous equations in the unknown constants a and b. So here we go. You can see this was our original equation. 4 equals a plus b times s plus 2a plus b. So if I look just at the s terms, we've got no s terms on the left, and we've got a plus b on the right, so that gives us this expression, a plus b equals naught. If I look just at the constants, we've got 2a plus b equals 4. So I've got two linear simultaneous equations which I can solve, and that gives me a equals 4, b equals minus 4. So I can then finish by writing g equals 4 over s plus 1 minus 4 over s plus 2. And for completeness, in case you can't see it, the inverse Laplace will therefore be 4 e to the minus t minus e to the minus 2t. Because 4 over s plus 1 is a standard exponential form, as is 4 over s plus 2. Right, let's look at a separate example now. We've got g of s equals 5 of s squared plus 6s plus 8. So the first thing is to factorise this and write it in partial fractions forms. So we're going to have a over s plus 2 plus b over s plus 4. Hopefully it was obvious to you what the factors of this pole polynomial were. Step 2 we multiply up by the denominator. So we're going to get 5 equals a times s plus 4 plus b times s plus 2. And then what we're going to do, step 3, is we're going to equate coefficients of s to the 0, s to the 1, s squared, and so on. So if I do s to the power 0, I've got 5 on the left and 4a plus 2b on the right. If I do s to the power 1, I've got 0 on the left and a plus b on the right, which gives me a equals minus b. Now, if I use a equals minus b in the equation above, then I'll use red. This implies 5 equals 4a minus 2a. OK? Which gives you, if I go down here, 5 equals 2a, or a equals 2.5, b equals minus 2.5. And therefore, finally, I get g equals 2.5 over s plus 2 minus 2.5 over s plus 4. So next example. Expand into partial fractions. g of s equals 10 of s times s squared minus s minus 2. So again, we want to um, work out where the poles are, and in this particular case, you can see you've got a pole at plus 2 and a pole at minus 1. So I can write this as a over s plus b over s minus 2 plus c over s plus 1. So there's my partial fraction structure. And then we do step 2, which is to multiply out by the denominator. So I get 10 equals a into s minus 2 s plus 1 plus b into s s plus 1 plus c into s s minus 2. And now I do my step 3 which is to equate different coefficients. Okay, so if I do s to the power 0 I get 10 equals minus 2a, and that's it, because the b terms and the c terms have got no constants because they've all got um, an s factor. So this implies 
a equals minus 5. If I then do s to the 1, I'm going to get 0 on the left equals minus a plus b minus 2c. And if I do s squared, I get 0 on the left equals a plus b plus c. So I can now solve these two linear simultaneous equations. If, if I put the 5 in, then minus a, minus a is plus 5, so I get 0 equals 5 plus b minus 2c. And over here, I get 0 equals minus 5 plus b plus c. Now I'm not going to solve those two simultaneous equations here, or not um, in great detail because it's relatively straightforward, but you could, for example, subtract the uh, one equation from the other and you would get naught equals 10 minus 3c, so you can see what um, c is, and similarly you could solve for b. So, in summary, we can look and say the last step would be to take the partial fractions we've just got and write down what the uh, corresponding time domain signals are, and those are shown on this slide, just for completeness. So for the last examples, you can see there is the A term, minus 5 over S, and that goes to a minus 5, and here was the B term, 10 over 3, and so you get a 10 over 3, E to the minus T, and so on.